All righty. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. And welcome to the 10th Annual Celebration of Faculty and Staff Scholarship and Creativity. And I'm very happy that you've taken the time to support your fellow faculty and staff who have contribute, uh, contributed items to the bibliography and to support Dr. Susan Forche today. Um, I'm going to quote um, Dr. Gary Hansen when he t said that this event, of this event, it's nice to applaud people who've done work during the previous year and to encourage those in the process of various projects right now. I'd like to also call your attention to the display as you came in of faculty publications. In the first two aisles, we cleared off some stuff. And those are uh, faculty uh, books and book chapters of our faculty who are with us and not with us um, for the past maybe 10, 15 years. And it's pretty impressive. And thanks to John Helmke and Megan Tui for creating that last summer. Anyway, since we began in 2007, faculty and staff have submitted over 1,300 pieces of scholarly and creative work for our bibliography. We've had about six, we've had 16 faculty presenters on a wide variety of topics. In the past, we had two presenters, and there have been some weird pairings over the years. <laughs> like, I think my favorite was in 2000, of, of weird pairings, was in 2010, Gary Hansen, a church historian, presented with Adam Hoffman, an environmental chemist. And that was an odd couple, but um, <laughs> Gary's talk was Calvin at 500, and Adam didn't have as much to say about that, but he had a lot to say about minding one's P's and Q's in rivers and streams. In some way, it all just fit together. Um, I, think it, I think everyone learned something that they didn't know that day. And the other thing that I've learned listening to our faculty presenters is that our faculty are amazing teachers. They're very creative and very good. So. Without further ado, I'd like to ask um, Dr. Sean Benson, Professor of Language and Literature, to come and lead us in prayer. Would you please join me in prayer? Gracious Father, we thank you for this day and the splendor of your creation. For even in late winter, as the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins said, no, said Nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things. We thank you too for your creation of the human intellect and for the life of the mind that we as a community nurture at UD. Amidst the riches we see around us today of faculty and staff, scholarship and creativity, may we continue to use your gifts in the service of students and of all those whose lives we touch. We ask your blessing upon Professor Forche as she presents her scholarship to those of us here, and we ask that you will continue to renew our minds on this campus and in this community. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, Mary Ann. As Mary Ann said, it has been 10 years of these events, and it is pretty remarkable when you look at the list in the back of your program of everything that's happened in the last year on this campus. I was thinking about how you talked about 1,300 uh, submissions, but also there's an acceleration in the number of submissions as, as we've moved along those years. So uh, thank you to all of you who are doing such great work, and it's, it's it's wonderful to be in a place where we can be so proud of our colleagues and the work they're doing contributing to, to the intellectual life, not just of this community, but, but to this world. And as I looked at the program, I thought the, the cover is very fitting because we are really blessed at UD not only to have colleagues that uh, reflect, that, that demonstrate intellectual activity, but to also have a physical home for that intellectual activity on that campus. I, I get a chance to talk to a lot of people at other colleges, and it's actually not the case that most of them would say their library is the true intellectual heart of the campus on a day-to-day -day basis. And at this institution, the library is the intellectual heart of our campus. And, and we have a beautiful facility and great resources, but we know that's really due to Mary Ann and our librarians and our support staff. And so I want to say thank you to you for, for all your work. <laughs> 
encouraging us in, in our academic endeavor. And a special thank you to Diane, Diana Newman, because I know she does a lot for this event. And so thank you, Diana. Uh, we've had five of our colleagues for whom the last 12 months have been significant in the sense that it reflects, it, it is in that time period when they uh, achieved a very significant academic accomplishment in receiving their terminal degree. So I'd like to just acknowledge those individuals so we can have a chance to once again celebrate with them what is a true academic milestone. Uh, Dr. Nick Bratcher, I know Nick's here, Assistant Professor of Music and Director of Instrumental Music. He received his EDD from the University of Georgia. His dissertation was titled Fraternal Music Organizations and Their Impact on Student Leadership in College Bands. Dr. Susan Forche, our speaker today, Assistant Professor of Discipleship and Christian Formation. She received her PhD from Boston University. Her dissertation is titled Prayer and Theological Education for Ministry for a Contemplative Practical Theological Pedagogy. Dr. Jim Gunn, undergraduate campus chaplain, received the Doctorate of Ministry from the University of Dubuque. His dissertation is titled Community Being Made in God's Image, the Mark of a Disciplined Life Together. And Dr. Christopher James, Assistant Professor of Evangelism and Mission. He received his PhD from Boston University, and his dissertation was titled New Churches in the Nun, N-O-N-E Zone, Practical Ecclesiology and Missional Wisdom Among Church Plants in Seattle. And Dr. Ken Turner, Assistant Professor of Science Education, received his EDD from National Lewis University. His dissertation is titled Perceived Barriers and Solutions, Engineering Design Implementation. And Dr. Lindsay Ward, Director of the First Year Experience, received her EDD from Edgewood College. And her dissertation is titled Faculty and First Year Student Interactions Outside the Classroom and Student Academic Success. Mm -hmm. Could you stand and then we can acknowledge you and congratulate you. For your Our speaker today, Dr. Susan Forche, joined the University of Dubuque campus in the fall of 2014. Before coming to UD, she was in Seattle, Washington, where she was manager of communication and operations mm -hmm. at Bethany Presbyterian Church, and she was an adjunct instructor at Seattle Pacific University. She'd also been involved with a nonprofit organization called Museum Without Walls, a group that facilitated educational tours of Ireland. As I just mentioned, she just completed her PhD from Boston University. She also has a Master of Divinity with a concentration in monastic studies from St. John's University in Minnesota. And she has a Bachelor of Arts in History from Western Washington University. Dr. Forche has led numerous retreats and workshops presented at many conferences. Her work ranges from audiences and topics from young adult Bible study curriculums to articles on homelessness. She also has a blog called The Contemplative Cottage, Attending Deeply to Life, which looks at contemplative practices in a technological age. On her blog, she describes herself as a tea drinker, cafe window seat sitter, theologian stargazer, contemplative professor, photo-taking poet, earth-loving artist, and follower of Jesus Christ. And I think in all of the rich images presented there, we're going to experience some of that as we hear her share her pedagogy of what I would call the pedagogy of the whole person today with us. Now those of us who've gotten to know Susan also know her as someone who loves travel, who's always up for a good conversation, and who's a wonderful and masterful teacher for our students. So would you join me in welcoming our speaker today, speaking on practicing modes of inquiry and reflection in the classroom and beyond a contemplative pedagogy. Would you welcome with me Dr. Susan Forshe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, cognitive studies tells us that really the first few minutes of a presentation is what people remember the most. So I'm going to fill these first few minutes with thanks and a parable. 
So the first thing I want to do is uh, thank you, Marianne, for inviting me. Thank you all of, to you for coming. It is an honor to be here. I've enjoyed getting to know many of you over this last year and a half that I've been here. It's been a wonderful experience for me to be here in Dubuque. And now I believe that a story actually can capture the dynamic that I'm going to be talking about a little bit more technically in a few moments. So join me in entering into this parable. Once upon a time, in a land not so far and distant from Dubuque, a young girl lived on a hill overlooking a wide valley, and across that forested valley was another hill opposite her own. And on it, about the same height, was another house. And often, she would stand on her porch and look over that valley to the house that was across the way, and on some rare, wonderful evenings, the house would flame for a few moments and then go, grow dark. She'd sigh and she'd say, oh, they must be so happy. They live in a house with shining windows. Years passed and she finally decided it was time. It was time to go on a journey and to find this house and to meet the people who live there and to find out what their life was like living in this house with shining windows. So she snuck away, but of course, before she left, she prepared a bag lunch and she took a map. She went down the path, down the hill, into the forest. The sun rose high, she stopped, she ate her lunch, she continued to walk, the sun started to lower, and she started to come up the hill and just as the light was disappearing from the sky, she reached the house, and it was just a house. It was a house not much different from her own. And with a heavy heart and disappointment, she knocked on the door and explained her situation to the couple, the perplexed couple that answered the door. And she couldn't return home that night, so they gave her a bed, and she went to sleep, sad, dreaming of houses with shining windows that had gone dark. Something hours later woke her up. And she got up and she looked out the window just as that wonderful gas flame blue of dawn was just starting to tinge the sky. And she noticed that there was a boy on the porch. And she went out and joined him and stood with him in silence. And she looked out across the valley because that's where he was <coughs> intently looking. And she looked and then almost she could glimpse her own house. And she turned to the boy and she was about to tell him and he said, wait, watch, it's about to begin. And then she looked and she saw just as light started to stream over the top of the hill her own house, shining, the windows aflame. And he said with a sigh, oh, they must be so happy who live in a house of shining windows. And she saw her house for the very first time. I found a quote that I think is appropriate for research by Paul Gardner, it's from the art world. And he says, a painting is never finished. It simply stops in an interesting place. So I'm hoping that this place, this stopping point of my own research is interesting to you. It's going to be, I, I've realized more and more that it's going to be my research probably for my whole career. Another quote that I think is also appropriate we will not cease from our exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. The journey of my reflection on the dynamics of inquiry began many years ago. 
I first read that parable, a briefest sketch of that parable, about 20 years ago. And I expanded on it and developed it, put a little bit of myself into it, and used it in my retreat and my formation work. But it was only recently, actually very recently, when I was rehearsing it in my head that I realized with a bit of that shining window moment that it was describing the very dynamic that I've spent the better part of 10 years trying to articulate. Even before that, when I was in middle school, one of my favorite words was contemplative. How I found out about that word, I really don't know. I have some ideas, which I won't go into, but I remember looking it up in the dictionary and somehow being captivated by it. And it's interesting that the seed of that continued with me through high school and through college and then into, I went to a monastery for my Master's of Divinity and then ultimately my dissertation has contemplative in the title. Now, since I'm using that as part of the title of this talk, I should define it. We often think of contemplative as possibly quiet or solitude or a monastery where monks or nuns are praying. But the best definition that I have found is a Jesuit, Walter Burghardt, and he calls it a long, loving look at the real. I want you to just let that sink in for a moment. A long, loving look at the real. So long, not frantic, not pushed, not a sense of time constraint, spacious. It's one of my, fa another favorite words, spacious. Loving, not compulsive, not grabby, but a sense of, I want to know you. Whether you as an idea or you as a person, I want to know you, I want to love you. And a look, not just simply look once and then look away, but look deeply, intently. And then the final piece I think is very important, and I also think this is an interesting wisdom, the real, not something a fantasy, not something necessarily in the past or in the future, but simply something right in front of us, right now, where the past and the future might affect, but looking at the real now, the context that we're in. One of the best ways, I think, to get into this as well is to talk a bit about some of these other points along the way that has helped me get into this research. Another piece of it is, surprisingly, I was exposed to uh, Lexio Divina, it's a monastic practice of prayer, reading scripture, um, at my Presbyterian church in Seattle. And this was about 20 years ago as well. And then, because I was so interested in this whole process of contemplative prayer and monastic studies, I decided to go to the monastery to get my MDiv. Now, I want you to take a look at this Alexio Divina. If you're not familiar with, Alexio Divina is a practice that uh, been around for about 1,800 years. Uh, it was codified in the 12th century by a monk named Guigo II, and it has four movements, reading, meditation, prayer, and contemplation. Now, that sounds somewhat abstract, so let me give you some, some uh, images to go with that. Guigo talks about it like a feast. He says the reading is you put the text into your mouth. It's like the food. And then the meditation, you're chewing the food, you're chewing the text for the flavor, the taste. You have to chew your food, then you swallow it, and you're starting to digest it, and that's the prayer. And that's an interesting image if you think of prayer as somehow digesting the text and letting it become part of you. And then contemplation, that moment after the wonderful Thanksgiving feast where you're kind of laying back on the couch, a little bit drowsy, and completely satisfied. That's how he described Lexio Divina and the reflection on a text. And I think it's a really helpful way for us to understand it. 
for me, it's often I've seen described as a circle or as a step-by-step -step process, but really the way that Guigo describes it is it's more of movement from one to the other and then back. As I practiced it over the years, I started to realize that it wasn't simply a step-by-step -step movement, but it was a dynamic movement, and so it's represented here three-dimensionally as a tetrahedron. Now there's something wonderful about tetrahedrons. All the points are connected to all the other points. So anchored in the text, the reading, you could move to meditation, but maybe you go back to reading for a while. And then maybe you move down to prayer for a while and then go back to meditation. And maybe for something strikes you and you rest in contemplation. And then you're right back into reading again. So imagine this dynamic movement amongst all four of these spaces. As an aside, I find that in this age of distraction, where reading has become somewhat uh, difficult with all of the different things that are competing for our, our attention, that this can be a way of relearning how to read, practicing attentive reading of texts, not just simply scripture. So with this background, as I began my doctoral work, I was a bit perplexed because I was getting a doctorate in practical theology and spirituality, and the first courses, of course, are all about method. How do we do this research? And I was reading through all of these different methods, and there was no space for prayer. And that perplexed me. Now, I understood academically why the data from prayer may not be academically admissible. I understood that piece, but at least in the fact that we were looking at church contexts and looking toward transformation and creating more just environments, more loving structures, more graceful ways of being in the world, I was perplexed that there wasn't a space that was designated where we could possibly ask where God was already working and maybe even ask for a greater wisdom to help us in this work. So that began. That began something that I did not realize at the time would be my dissertation. One of the things that we did in practical theological methods was we created something called a thick description. And it was always done like that with scare quotes, a thick description. And I honestly, every time I heard that phrase, that's exactly what I thought of, <laughs> was a thick description. And often it felt more like that. <laughs> we were looking at, uh, when we took a context, and there were a variety of contexts in our classes that we would study, uh, we would look at the context and we would look at soft and hard sciences. Anything that could help us, any data we could bring in and then place into conversation with the tradition, with uh, theology, with bu the Bible, uh, with all of these different aspects within the Christian tradition to then work toward transformation. About the same time, I was doing some side reading. I have this love of astronomy. And about the same time, there was a lot of uh, information coming out about cosmic microwave background radiation. I don't know if you've come across that or not. There's a beautiful picture of it. I love, I love astronomy because the, the pictures are so amazing that are coming from our, our cosmos. What this is, some of the earliest <coughs> photons from the creation of the universe. And we can see them. And about this time, the precision of dating our universe got to be very, very close. 13.7, 13.8 billion years old. I took a look at that, and I started thinking about 13.7 billion years, and I started to realize there was not a thick enough description <coughs> for anything that I was researching. It would never be enough. And at that point, I realized no matter all the academic arguments for not having that space for prayer or for that wider experience of a greater knowledge, I decided there had to be one. 
even if it was just simply, here's that space where I'm going to ask those questions. Michael Pogliani, a scientist and philosopher, chemist actually as well, writes that we know more than we can tell objectively and that even the most objective scientific study starts in tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge, knowledge that we really don't know where it comes from. To use the image of the parable that I told at the beginning, why does a person see a specific house with shining windows? Why does a theologian find the word contemplative so fascinating at such a young age? What makes each of us, each of you, choose the topics that you're interested in and spend years researching? What spurs our students on to make a journey to new knowledge and sometimes even without a map or a packed lunch? Those people who blaze trails into new knowledge and new discoveries. I had my students watch uh, Andy Goldsworthy's uh, River and Tides. I don't know if any of you have seen that. He's a sculptor. He's done thousands of work, works outdoors and then photographs them. Amazing contemplative works. If you haven't seen it, go out and watch it. It's amazing. One of the things I realized even as I watched it for I don't know how many times uh, with my students yesterday, I was thinking he is one of those people. Why, why does he have this, this desire to go out into the natural world and create these works of beauty? That's something I can appreciate, but that's not something that has driven me. Why does he have that? And then I look among my students and I think each one of them has these things that spur them on. And how can I encourage them on that journey to new knowledge? The moment of reaching toward the horizon beyond current knowledge, beyond the thick description, I decided fit well in that image of prayer in Lexio Divina. This came actually also out of reading theologians with an eye to how they navigated their objective study and the practice of prayer in their own lives. And in my dissertation that's on the table over there, if you're interested, I researched Karl Barth. Uh, Eugene Peterson and Marjorie Suhaki, all Protestant theologians uh, from different traditions within Protestantism and how their theological frameworks and their practice of prayer operated together. We often have this sense of theology is over here and prayer practice is over here and I wanted to read them clearly as if that wasn't the case and I found that truly wasn't the case. It was clearly in their work that they both had theological reflection and prayer practices side by side. Now you might be thinking, prayer, what does that mean? Well, I define it as a theologian, as a dialogue with God. And I could go more specifically, but I'm not going to. That's for another lecture. But one thing I will say is that it's a moment of dialogue, a moment of dialogue. This is the place for me where God embraces into my reflection. But it also, at the very beginning, could simply be an experience of dialogue between what we know and the openness for what we don't. It's not so much verifiable data, but as an openness to seeing context and situations differently, looking more deeply for connections, and then turning, turning back and seeing that somehow things where we started look different. Somehow new knowledge has occurred, maybe inspiration or intuition or synchronicity of events not noticed before. There's a new perspective. Again, as a theologian, I would say, I'm seeing there the work of the Holy Spirit. But someone who wouldn't use those terms could simply say, I'm seeing something new here. I'm seeing an inspiration that I did not have before. So these reflections help my own questions as I talked back to my own field. But I found that my students, as I started to teach, especially when I got to Seattle Pacific University, college freshmen, uh, they needed some additional things that I thought this method might address. And you have this in front of you. Uh, 
that I'll be referring to. As I began teaching, I saw one part is that they needed a practice where they could learn and they could take the practice with them into their work, their ministry, lives, whatever they were going to be doing, that would help them reflect on situations and contexts that they found themselves in and discern the next most faithful step, personally or in a community. The other thing is the practice needed to be flexible enough that it could fit a variety of contexts and allow for the varying perspectives within the Christian tradition and beyond that it could work in educational settings where students came from a variety of traditions and formation, religious or not. And I have had the opportunity, now that I've been here at the University of Dubuque, to teach it both at the seminary, but also teach it in one of the Judeo-Christian Studies classes. And it was interesting to be in that context and to find that they, with practice, they were moving through this method to reflect on contexts. Something else that I saw that was needed by my students that this practice I hoped would address is cultivation of attention, attention in an era of distractions. So the classroom could become this great, uh, this microcosm of the macrocosm, a place where they could read context, they could reflect, they could dialogue, they could rest, letting the yeast of reflection rise the bread and then return to see the context under investigation in a new way. It wasn't practiced just once. It wasn't simply I lectured on this and then said, okay, go run with it. It was that day after day, every day, we would take a context and the first question I would say, so what do we do? And after a few times of that, their response would be, read the context. And we would, then we were off and running, describing describing it in concrete detail, using all the different data that we could pull. And then we would find that we would start to move into the other kinds of reflection, naturally. Reflecting on, well, what do you think about this? Now that you have some of the concrete details, what do you think? How do you feel? Is there a place where you realize you don't have enough information? Or a place where you're feeling a humble openness to the possibility of learning new information? Is there a moment where we need to take a break and we need to rest to let the yeast rise and then we go back to the context and something's changed, something's different? Craig Dykstra, a practical theologian, writes, engagement in certain practices may give rise to new knowledge. That our practices and habits lead to changes in our brain structures is the subject of numerous books right now. Uh, John Medina is one of my favorite, currently a biologist and brain researcher, and he describes the way the human brain makes memories, learns, and creates habits. So here's our campus. Here's a map of it. Now, if President Bullock were to decide this summer to dig up all of the sidewalks on campus and then have it reseeded. Okay, so it's just grass. And then all the students come back in the fall. What would happen? What would happen? People would walk the old trails. Walk the old trails. Okay, so, so they would walk paths. They would make paths. <laughs> yeah, what would happen over time? Maybe over the first semester before the snows. The grass would die in certain places, okay? So you would probably see some paths that were not quite, the, the grass would be bent. But you could see a little bit, people had walked them. And then there were other paths that would be really narrow. You know, you've been out in the woods and you've seen this happen. And then there would probably be ones that were wider paths that was just dirt. Okay, so that's exactly how the brain makes memories and creates habits. So if we think of that as working memory, the walking the path, you're walking, and you keep going back and forth. You're rehearsing the knowledge, and you're, you're entering that into your short-term memory. And then it's starting to be entered into long-term memory over time. The other piece of this is the brain does it uh, the most efficient path possible in the brain between the different neural nets. And so the same thing would happen here. The, the paths to the different, the different buildings would be the most efficient path to those buildings. 
Now what would happen is, what would be the wisest thing to do is then find the paths that were the deepest and put concrete on those. And that is long-term memory. And actually long-term memory can take up to 12 years to form. It's a long time. And what that really helps me understand as an educator, that one time through a practice, two times, three times, a whole semester may not be enough actually to encourage this long-term practice. But at least it's better than simply just once. Something else about this from another influence on my research, uh, expertise studies, a new field. Uh, K. Anders Erickson is one of the researchers in this, and he defines deliberate practice, activities designed for the sole purpose of effectively improving specific aspects of an individual's performance. You might have heard about expertise studies through Malcolm Gladwell and the 10,000 hour rule. Now one thing that's missed often when we talk about the 10,000 hours to becoming an expert is that that rehearsal going over the path is not simply just rote rehearsal. It's actually a rehearsal that's coached. It's you're playing the piano and rather than playing through the song and making the same mistake at ev every time you play it through, you go to the place you're making the mistake and play that over and over until you know it. And then you play it again and find another place that you need to practice, deliberate practice, until you know that. So the same thing can happen in a classroom with this method, is that you're coaching the students through. I'm coaching them through and giving them feedback as they're reflecting, helping them navigate through the somewhat more messy aspects of the personal reflections and the interpersonal reflections. There are many more influences on this research journey. I've just given you a few. But one last that I'll mention is a use of language, and you'll see it on your sheets. Uh, I found that there was, uh, in a new field that's just starting to make some inroads in higher education, contemplative studies, um, mostly uh, uh, practitioners from Buddhist tradition who are practicing um, mindfulness meditation and other forms of meditation in the classroom, uh, they are talking about language in the different kinds of reflection, and they're using the different pronouns. So, what we would talk about as that objective, rigorous, scientific study of an idea or a context or a situation, that is third person, okay? And as a person who loves science, I love this kind of reflection. I want it to be rigorous. I want it, them to understand every possible detail. Then, the other piece that contemplative studies brings in is that there's the uh, first person reflection that I place on the reflection point of the tetrahedron. First person reflection is, okay, what do I think about this? And what do I feel about this? And that may be the part where we're helping our students uh, become more articulate about their own thoughts and feelings in appropriate ways. And then there's the second person reflection, the dialogue. Dialogue that's intrapersonal between people in the classroom, the classroom as a group, the person with the material itself, and then here what I, I would say is that dialogue with the unknown and theologically that dialogue with God, the inbreaking of God into the study. And then another piece of this, borne out also in the cognitive studies as well, that the brain needs rest. And so every class I try to provide some opportunity for people to take a rest. Uh, studies are showing that if you give a, uh, an activity that is off topic, people will come back to the original topic much more attentive. And so there's a need for that rest. And also we experience this just in our daily lives. Somebody asks a question, what was the name of so-and-so, and oh, I don't remember. But then an hour later, when I'm not even thinking about it, the name comes back. So it's that sense of the relaxing of thought can actually lead to new connections as the brain continues to work. 
helping students navigate each of these modes of inquiry does not privilege one to the exclusion of the others. And I think that's something that has happened over time. We've We've excluded some things out of the classroom. I have found that, obviously, in the case of practical theology and spirituality, that a piece of it I found was missing that actually is part of the tradition and part of the scholarly work. But it does start with that third person investigation, and it does allow space for the others, the more messy dynamics, to be acknowledged. One last thing that I will mention is that you will notice on your handouts and on this slide that I add in under reflection reason, experience, tradition, and scripture. When we're dealing with the, the more messiness of asking the question, what do you think? What do you feel? A way to help I have found students navigate that is to actually say, okay, what is your reason saying? What are some of the things that you know that, you can, that can help you articulate what you think about this, or what are some of your experiences that are, um, for better or for worse, uh, getting in the way or helping you understand this situation. I often use the image of the hand behind the head. We know the hand is there. It's there. We can't see it, though. It, it's affecting us in some way. It could be doing things like this. Um, but we know it's there, and the moment of reflection is bringing the hand around and saying, oh, Okay, it's five fingers and, and there's a ring on the finger. I'm actually able to look at what is affecting me in my learning and in my research. So that's what those four sources help a student do. Tradition is simply those ongoing practices that we have that have formed us over time. Tradition within the church or outside in cultural traditions, co-cultures. Um, and then scripture. From my field, scripture plays an important part in this dialogue, in this conversation. Uh, no matter what a person's perspective is on scripture, scripture comes into the conversation in some way. Okay, I, I cannot give a lecture without actually having people listening do something. So I'm going to ask you to do something. This may sound very technical and think, oh, this would take a long time to actually do. I'd like for us to do this in a pretty much under three minutes, okay? So the first thing I want you to do, I'm inviting you to do, is I want you to look at the room. And go ahead, turn around if you're in the front row. Go ahead, look, at, we feel uncomfortable, especially in this, this dynamic. Look around, who's here? What do you see? Okay, so give me some concrete descriptions of this room. Wood. Wood, okay. Light filled. Light filled. Light filled, yes. Green. Okay. People. What is it? Library. It's a library. <laughs> I'm glad you answered that. Yay! <laughs> okay. One more. One more. Concrete description. Chairs. Chairs. How are the chairs arranged? In rows, okay? Okay. What do you think about this room? How do you feel about this room? Take a moment. Okay. It's warm. Warm. As in welcoming. Okay. At least what I'm feeling right now. <laughs> <laughs> scholarly. Okay, yes. What makes it scholarly in your in your opinion? Listening to a presentation. Okay, okay, so the purpose for this event, listening to someone talk about research, okay? Um, a presentation. What else? Okay. Airy. Airy. Part of the field of dreams with Oh, so there's a memory. Okay, so there's a memory in there. Um, field of dreams. 
Mary Ann said at one point, the, what was it? Yeah, at one point, this, the whole library, when we were redoing the library, that, making the new library, the whole library was crammed in here. So I can never be in this room without thinking how crammed we were for that one year and how one time a bat flew in, and that was fun. <laughs> okay, bat. <laughs> and that was your office, right? That was my office. That was your office, I okay. I didn't get that far. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, is there feelings? I mean, you're feeling um, airy and scholarly and warm as and welcoming. Are there other feelings that you're having um, being here in Anxious. this room? Hmm? Anxious. Anxious. Okay. I always find this room cozy. Cozy. Okay. Okay. Now, the next one it's going to require you to move. Okay, so I'm going to prepare you. What I'd like for you to do is look around at, and find something that you noticed that you've seen from a distance. And I want you to actually go up to it and to look at it more closely. Now I'm talking as if it's an object. If you've seen a person that you would like to go up and say hello to, <laughs> please do so. Okay? More than likely, you'll probably choose something not a person. But that's OK. So go ahead. Move. And stay with your object or your person, OK? Don't go back to your seat. I love it. I love that. When we designed this, I was like, this is ridiculous. We look, it's supposed to go with our German heritage. And it's, it totally looks like a confessional. It's totally. totally. Like yes, yeah. That's great. That's great. Okay, if you're at your object, take a look at it. Take a look at it. Oh, I see people getting food. Yes. <laughs> food is an object. Yeah, that's for sure. Okay, now what I'd like for you to do is turn, turn from where you are and look back to where you came from. And I want you to look at the room from that perspective. Do you see anything different that you might not have seen before? I see people standing around the room. But not <laughs> OK, so then I, I would like you to turn to the person next to you. Or if you're in groups, go ahead. That's fine. And I'd like you to share one thing. What was it that you went and looked at? What was it that you went and looked at? Okay? <laughs> okay. So now I want you to just think for a minute. I want you to look around the room again. Now, I'm pretty sure, I, I mean, I just have to say that it's an interesting thing Marianne was just talking about in the little um, decorations that are at the end of the, where, where we've seen those kinds of decorations in other, in other contexts. But how many of you have learned something about this room that you didn't know before you came in? Raise your hand. How many have seen something new or different that you hadn't seen? Okay, so this is, as I said, this is just a microcosm of the practice. Usually I take about 45 minutes with my students and do a more in-depth context. But even in just three minutes, you can see a space differently. You can actually even see, since we were in rows, you can see the people. That's a new thing. You can see who all was here. So with that, We will not cease from exploration, and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susan. <laughs> I'd like to thank Susan Forche again, please.
also thank Mark Ward for um, helping us with this event. Particularly, it was his idea to do the brochure and my idea for him to pay for it. <laughs> and um, for the library staff who contributed so much to this event, especially Diana Newman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.